Welcome to Veterans Voices on WOWK 13. Now, here's Jennifer Abney and Patrick Simon. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us. 13 News Special Veterans Voices. For the next hour, we'll be sharing stories of courage, patriotism and honor of some extraordinary service members. And we begin tonight by taking you on a special trip aboard Honor Flight Huntington to Washington, D.C., honoring the men and women who are the reason we are free. A lot of these veterans, they didn't have the things that we have now. These welcome homes, the elaborate parties, they didn't get it. You know, you talk to the World War II and the Korean guys, they're like, oh, we just hopped off the bus and walked home. There was no fanfare, no nothing. And then we all know what happened with the Vietnam veterans and how they were treated. So this is just a small, small thing that we can do to honor them and let them know that we really appreciate them and we're thankful for them and the sacrifices that they and their families made for us. Yes, sir. Thank you for organizing it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Allow this to be a day of peace and joy. Allow your grace to follow them. Keep everyone safe. And as they walk through these memorials, allow the memories to bring them to a place of peace. There's a lot of the guys I'd like to see in World War II, but I didn't get to see them. plane and you see those those veterans and their faces and just the welcome that they receive it's it's just awesome sacrifice they gave their life when I look at these veterans I think my papa you know that's what I think but you know we have so much fun and, and they're guys you know we have a lot of fun there's a lot of stories we were there and um, we learn something every trip we take the lady sitting behind me uh, I had my hat on and she said thank you for your service and that means so much uh, now even then since we didn't get it, I guess, when we came home. Forward! Arch! Please, return to the post. We give thanks for the service of these men and women and the price that they paid, the sacrifices that they made, and we ask that this be a blessing. That they come back here recognizing that they are honored and loved and that they are not forgotten. special time they had in a wonderful welcome home. If you would like to nominate a veteran for a future honor flight, go to myhonorflighthuntington.org. Well, members of the Air Force are helping to keep memories alive through music for some World War II veterans. The soundtrack of their youth was the American Songbook and the big bands of the 40s. And that's exactly what the Airmen of Note provides. This group of swing musicians says its greatest joy is playing for groups. And recently, the Airmen of Note had the privilege to play for a group of veterans on another honor flight, this one out of Texas. This brought me back to the days when I was dating my wife right out of high school. Such an amazing program. 
Well, we all remember significant firsts in our lives, but for one brave and beloved West Virginia war hero, his first these days come around once in a lifetime, and it's only fitting for this living legend. I promise you, I will be a true American, and I will vote, and I will not break a single law. <laughs> Teaching our youngest citizens valuable life lessons. Oh, isn't that wonderful? That is wonderful. Uh, to yeah. think that something you said would yep. have an influence on somebody like that. Reading hundreds of thank you letters. Postal man's got to be <laughs> unhappy with me. From children he speaks to about giving back, being a thankful American, and sacrifice. I guess I had a, a, a deep desire to serve. That desire surfaced early in Woody Williams' life, a teenager 72 years ago fighting one of the bloodiest battles of the Pacific. It was February 23rd, 1945, the same day this iconic patriotic image was captured at Iwo Jima. American forces were getting slaughtered after failing to clear through fierce Japanese front lines. Corporal Woody Williams would be their only hope. To ask what, uh, of Woody to do what we needed him to do was basically a death sentence, but we couldn't do nothing. Woody's courageous decision would change the course of American history. And he went in there and for four and a half hours, he uh, operated six flamethrowers, which are basically about 100 pounds of gear. He broke that line of defense and a thousand guys got moving forward, securing the first airfield. Again, the strategic pur uh, purpose of taking the island. And he knew most likely he was gonna die or get horribly injured, but he did it anyway. Of the four Marines who protected Woody from enemy fire that day, two of them were struck down. You know, those two Marines paid the ultimate sacrifice, protecting his life. After the war, Woody received the Medal of Honor and to this day gives thanks to those who protected him. I wouldn't have the Medal of Honor itself if it were not for others. But it is very humbling, really is extremely humbling, to be put into that position and you can't give an explanation of why it happened. He really has a hard time comprehending why so many top honors come his way, or as he calls them. I've had so many firsts, really, I have. Firsts. Like going to the Super Bowl. Right. Why me? Or the first living person to have a military center named for him. Only Marine that has a Armed Forces Training Center with his name on. Why me? And a Navy ship that honors him. Ever see. His foundation continues to give back to families of the fallen. And I don't have the answer to those questions. We do. There's a theme here. I've got to do something for other people, not me, for them. At a time when we search for real heroes, this one is right in front of us. One of these days I'm gonna find out what that answer is, why me? Because Woody Williams, selfless servant, compassionate family advocate, and brave American. I hope in the end result, it won't be just about me. Is a living legend. He just turned 95 last month. He's still going strong. And so humble. He's yeah. just an amazing guy. And you know what? There's one more honor bestowed on Woody Williams just this year. The VA hospital in Huntington was renamed in his honor in September. A ceremony was held and a plaque was unveiled with the new name Herschel Woody Williams VA Medical Center. It's an 80 bed acute medical and surgical facility. Fellow veterans praise Williams for his devotion to veterans and their families. I think it's absolutely amazing. I think definitely it should it should be. It shouldn't have taken this mm -hmm. long. Um, he's a he's a great man. So yes, absolutely, it needed to be done. The Herschel Woody Williams VA Medical Center serves more than 30,000 veterans in West Virginia, Southern Ohio, and Eastern Kentucky. Now to an honor 100 years in the making for a World War I veteran. A Cabell County family remembers their loved one who lost his life in the line of duty. 13 News' Lily Bradley has the story. He's a hero to all of us. A hero, long gone, but not forgotten. You know, it's such a wonderful thing to be able to honor a family member that I felt like I knew. In spirit, I know. A hundred years to the day that Private Raymond Roy Beckett died in the line of duty, his family gathered to say thanks. You normally see a name and two dates. 
and all of the information that uh, is associated with that person between those two dates just sort of evaporates. Determined to learn more about his great uncle, Alan Johnson did some research. At just 24 years old, Private Beckett was killed in action on July 18, 1918. We want our boy sent home. Originally, Beckett was buried in France, but his family thought to have their son brought home. Oh, that means the world to us to know that he's here with us. Now those left doing their part to thank not just their hero, but all of the heroes who have gone before us. We've adopted several, several people now. They should be remembered. They, they gave their all. In Gable County, Lily Bradley, 13 News, working for you. God is Every day, 22 veterans take their own lives. Many of them suffer from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. For senior airman Lloyd Nelson, sadly, he has had to deal with the impact from both. He has lost friends to suicide, and he personally suffers from PTSD, connected to multiple deployments. But it wasn't until his wife, Captain Holly Nelson, got involved that he finally received help. I know when I got back, I mean, she brought it up to me that, you know, I should probably at least bring it up to the VA's attention and see what, what's out there. He later told me, you know, you saved me um, by just being there for me. I was in a bad spot. I was drinking all the time, just making bad decisions in my life, and uh, you helped pull me out of that. We'll show you what the Nelsons are doing together to cope with PTSD, and we'll tell you about new programs offered by the VA that are proving successful. Right. Watch my special right. report Monday, November 12th, right here on 13 News. Well, this year marks 15 years since West Virginia's own Jessica Lynch was taken prisoner of war in Iraq. In this exclusive interview, I had the privilege to sit down with Jessica and take a look back at where she's been and what lies ahead. We'll get, at least in front of us. It was the rescue seen round the world so here with you, Jessica. of the soldier who became a household name. So great, Jessica. Jessica Lynch was just 19 years old when she was injured and captured by Iraqi forces after her unit was ambushed in Iraq. Waking up and seeing about four or five Iraqi men looking down on me. That was Jessica's first memory after the attack. She says her faith was crucial in the days that followed. And all my comrades were either killed or taken separately from me. So just being in the hospital and being alone and not having anyone to talk to for nine days, the only person that you can kind of look toward is, is God. Woo! The chopper is touching down in Work County. Jessica Lynch has come home. Her homecoming was unlike anything she could have imagined, marked with celebrations and fanfare and the news conference where she made that famous declaration. That I'm an American soldier too. That later became the title of her book. There were parades with motorcades and media appearances and being honored with some of the most recognized women of 2003. I like that it's a diverse group of women. I like that it's everywhere, you know, from Britney Spears to Vera Wang to Jessica Lynch to, to me. But it wasn't just her bravery for surviving that harrowing experience that garnered Jessica fame and respect. It was her refusal from the beginning to go along with false military accounts that she went down firing her weapon instead of being knocked unconscious. That's not the truth. That's not what really happened. I could have easily taken credit for everything that they had said mm -hmm. um, because the other four, my other four comrades were killed in my vehicle. So no one would have no one. Now, 15 years later, Jessica still bears the scars of that attack. She requires a brace on her leg to this day. It's mainly because where they broke my back, um, I lost nerve. Well, nerve damage all the way through the leg. But help for her emotional scars has been even harder to come by. Jessica lost her best friend in that attack. The hardest part was knowing that Lori had died beside me. There's definitely a survivor's guilt there that I've had to live with, but mm -hmm. I don't think I will ever get over. You know, Lori had two children at the time. Um, they're 18 and 19 now. So in a couple of weeks, I will be out there and get to see them. Family, friends, and faith have been the driving forces on Jessica Lynch's road to recovery, which has taken her around the world through unimaginable highs and lows. But amazingly, along the way, 
she found joy in her journey. Um, I am very happy. I mean, it's taken 15 years to kind of get to the point where I'm at today. I definitely did not come home this way. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's been it's been a work in progress. But I think one of the biggest things for me was just having the support. I mean, the support of West Virginia. Thank you for this welcome, and it's great to be home. Welcome back to Veterans Voices. World War II was a difficult time for our nation as a whole. Our troops engaged in battle overseas. But for African Americans serving their country at the time, there was also a battle being waged right here on American soil. Reporter Stephanie Harris shares the story of an American hero who shares his experience as one of the legendary Tuskegee Airmen. I still play golf. I'm still, still trying to get dates. <laughs> <laughs> and at 92 years young, Dr. Harry Quinton is laughing his way through life. <laughs> By his smiles and jokes, you'd never know all the struggles he's been through. So life wasn't easy. If I could just get in and show what I could do, that I could survive. That attitude started at 16 when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Still in high school in Maryland, Quinton enlisted in the Army Reserves and trained as an aviation mechanic. He ended up at Daniel Field in Augusta, Georgia. There he saw firsthand how blacks in the military were treated differently. They had German POWs who were just laying around drinking soda, smoking cigarettes having a good time and I, I said wow they're treating the German prisoners better than they are <clears throat> us. Quinton eventually ended up with the famous Tuskegee Airmen, the group of African-American pilots when he was sent to California. We knew what we were doing was something we hadn't been given an opportunity to, be, to do before and we also knew that everybody thought we couldn't do it. Although he never went abroad to fight, he served his country following the war overseas and witnessing segregation at home. He says he always asked why blacks joined the war. Say we as a people had decided we weren't going to participate. It would have set us back another hundred years. After leaving the service, Quinton got married, went to school for accounting, but still found it hard to get a job. Soon they saw who I was, the whole attitude changed. Quinton ended up working for our businesses like Pan American Airlines and eventually spent 23 years as an IRS auditor for the Department of Treasury. The gowns an award from the Treasury Department for my years of service. That hangs on his wall with all the other awards and pictures, including those of his fellow airmen. This is when I met the president. Quinton now spends his time speaking about his experiences. I enjoy it and it's rewarding. I mean, I get all these accolades and attention, it feels good. And we feel good knowing he's sharing his story with others. I believe that if you prepare yourself and when the opportunity comes, you have to be ready. I'm Stephanie Harris reporting. Up next on Veterans Voices, remembering veterans from the war to end all wars and a special connection to one West Virginia town. Every year, NASCAR honors fallen veterans with its Memorial Day race, known as the 600 Miles of Remembrance. Each race car bears the name of a fallen service man or woman, and the driver meets their family. For one West Virginia family, it was an unforgettable experience. To carry the name of U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Robert White. And there's our driver, Chris Boster, number 37. May be part of an annual tradition for a NASCAR driver. But he was you know, very, very nice to us. We had not followed race cars that much, but uh, being at the race is nothing like it is on TV. For Stan and Shirley White. It was incredible, but it was exhausting. <laughs> it's another way to keep the memory of one of their fallen sons alive. Bob always had a smile. He just enjoyed life. But he was younger. His ambition was to be a bum on the beach. Robert was killed in action in 2005 in Afghanistan. You lose a child. I said, well, time will heal. No, it doesn't. It just finds you, helps you find a way to deal with it. The Whites have had to deal with losing two of their four children. Andrew was a serious one. Marine Corporal Andrew White served in Iraq. 
and uh, he was on a, a drill team that won a national championship at Capitol High School. He thought that if he could become a Marine, he would be, that would be top of the line. He would, be, he'd, he would outdo his brothers. And suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder until 2008. Andrew was being treated by VA and died as a result of medications given to him as prescribed. Dealing with loss has given this Gold Star family a new purpose. Well, I never ask another parent how'd your son or daughter die. Doesn't matter. What the White family wants you to know is that behind every American serviceman, there is a story. It's not about how they died, though. It's about how they lived. I do what I do because our boys aren't here to do it. And they say a person dies twice. Once at the physical death and one when the name is no longer said. Which is why we put our energies into groups and activities that will help the other veterans. It gives us some comfort. The Whites dedicate themselves to preserving Robert. He loved his skiing. He coached Little League basketball team. His son was on that team. And Andrew. He was the type of kid that would help anyone. You focus on what they did when they were alive. You don't focus on their death. Through their memories and through experiences like visiting a NASCAR race. And then there's a the car. Car. It was called a day that will live in infamy. Now, almost 77 years later, one of the survivors of that attack donates his time to help remember those he lost. Welcome back to our 13 News special, Veterans Voices. 77 years ago, in November of 1941, a war alert was lifted. The following month, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor in two waves on a Sunday morning. More than 3,500 killed or wounded, 21 ships sunk or damaged. Kathy Menuno spoke with one of Hawaii's four remaining Pearl Harbor survivors. Good morning, sir. Very nice to meet you. Thank you. Everett Highland. Hello. Fist bumping. You give fist bumps, there you go. Quipping. Every day above ground is a good one. Obliging. Can we take your picture? Certainly. Okay. Take a picture with you? Yes. Thank you. At Pearl Harbor's Arizona Memorial Visitor Center, volunteering his time for 23 years now, now 95 years old. It gets me out of the house. <laughs> And close to his memories as an 18-year-old sailor on the Pensy, the battleship USS Pennsylvania. I was a smart teenager. I figured if we ever go to war, the last place in the world I want to be stuck is in the radio quarters down in the middle of the ship. And that's where he was December 7th, 1941, when peace shattered. This is not a drill. This is not a drill. General Porter, General Porter, go on hands on your battle station. The Pensy was in dry dock across Battleship Row. Highland ran up to the battle station on the aft deck. He says five high-altitude bombers flew overhead. They all release their bombs at the same time, and we took one hit. The ship's downs and caisson in front of the Pensy destroyed, behind smoke billowing from the Arizona. The other fellows with me, Harold Comstock, Clarence Oss, Joe Mahofsky, Jim Owen, Joe Pace, were, were killed. Highland wounded beyond recognition. And he came over and he bent over and he looked at me and he said, who are you? And I said, it's Highland. And all he did was back away going, ah, ah, very good for the morale. <laughs> Evidently, I was quite a mess. Nine months of recovery and he was back on the ship, only left the Navy after the war ended. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service. You're welcome. Highland's a retired elementary school science teacher. He moved to Hawaii in the year of the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor when he met his wife, Miyoko, from Japan. Thank you. 
He used to volunteer here five days a week. Now it's down to one, with no plans of going to none. I'm as proud as these fellows are with their uniform on. <laughs> They're in a great organization, and I appreciate you. Thank you, sir, for your service. At Pearl Harbor, I'm Kathy Muneno. A local family hopes a renewed effort will finally bring home their soldier lost in the forgotten war when veterans' voices continue. Welcome back to Veterans' Voices. More than six decades after the end of the Korean War, the U.S. continues to identify recent human remains returned from Korea. Some tri-state families are hopeful that their loved ones are among those who could finally be coming home. Inside their family home in Sissonville, Joe Chandler and his wife Juanita sit and wait for Joe's younger brother Teddy to come home. We was always close with each other, you know. The last time Joe heard his brother's voice, I told him to take care of himself. You know that talk. And uh, the kind of stuff big brothers tell their little brothers. And uh, uh, when it may be their last talk. Try to come home safe. That last goodbye was almost 70 years ago. And that's when Joe was on his way back home after serving in Germany, while Teddy was heading out to fight in a new war, Korea. Private Teddy Ray Chandler joined the Army just a day after his 18th birthday in July of 1950. North Korean forces had already invaded the South Korean border and Teddy Chandler and the 35th Infantry Regiment were thrown into the worst of it right away. By November, his company lost ground along the bank of the Chongchong River. Eventually, their lines of defense failed. It was the worst loss of American lives in the Korean War. Very few survived. Back at home, his mother Mary held on to hope. She looked so much forward to thinking that he would make it back. He would come home one day. At first, Teddy was reported missing in action, but then presumed dead. His body never found. She passed away and never knew about it. And she always, she always thought that she would find out something about me. But she didn't. No, she didn't. Time is also running out on Joe. He's 89, the last survivor of seven children who grew up with Teddy. After all this time with no answers, Joe wonders if his brother, who served in what's often called the Forgotten War, was himself forgotten. I feel that they, they did go over there and try, but they got what they could get and bring back, but then they just quit. That was over 12 years ago, the last time Joe heard from a group searching for Teddy. And while the process of recovering remains is still very slow, it's improving. Here at the new Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency in Hawaii, the largest forensic anthropology lab in the world, researchers sift through remains of missing service members using DNA to match and return them to loved ones. This process also depends on the relationship between our country and the host country. In Teddy's case, we're talking about North Korea, which up until recently has been very cold. Thank you. But now that appears to be changing. We got back. Our great fallen heroes, the A recent agreement between the United States and North Korea cleared the way to return more remains of American troops. Do you have hope? Yeah. Yeah. For Joe Chandler, that news, after all these years... Makes you... ...of tears... Makes you say it. <clears throat> ...could finally help bring closure. But, you know, it, it, it's something that you always look forward to, and it, uh, you know, to uh, bring him home and, and put him away. And make sure he is not forgotten as they sit and wait, and now... I pray for him every night. Pray. I know God can do anything. And if it's meant to be, I believe he will bring it back. Back to his family. We just have to wait and see. And Joe. I can just tell him how much I missed him. To give a formal goodbye. His little brother and hero, Teddy, deserves.